Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Easy Learning Station. Today I have a very interesting personality with me. Uh, let's talk to him something about what he, how or how he looks at life and how he looks at success. Assalamu alaikum, Sir Shreya Sultan Khan. Mashallah. I met you last on my last trip to Islamabad and I found you to be a really learned person. I want to learn from you. Like in your 90 years of experience in life, how do you see success or what do you think about success? Well, Isha, if you are wanting me to recount my 90 years of life, <laughs> that, for that you need maybe months. But anyway, I mean, uh, I mean, in a way, I was very unfortunate that my mother died when I was only three years old. But uh, my maternal grandfather, he adopted me. And he was in the civil service of uh, UP. So at that time, you know, the colonial deputy commissioners, they were really something. And I was really dazzled by his work and uh, also uh, by the respect that was given to him and so the status inspired. that he was given. So you were yes. inspired so by inspired. your maternal uncle. And uh, I thought when I would grow up, I would really like to join the civil service. Okay. So that was your goal? Yes. I mean, that's why my education, I mean, hmm. a lot of people uh, wanted me to, why don't I do science subjects and uh, be a doctor or be an engineer? But firstly, I mean, I had no interest in those subjects and secondly, my objective was <laughs> really the civil service and my grandfather uh, had done his master's in English literature okay. in 1917. So I thought that English literature is really the key to becoming a civil servant. So that's what I did. I did my master's in 1953 from mm -hmm. Lucknow University. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, prior to that, something had happened which uh, was very un unplanned, I should say. Okay. Uh, because uh, uh, when I did my high school, mm. and I was with my grandfather, and of course, as a deputy commissioner, he used to be transferred from one district to the other district. Right. So, after that, when he got transferred to a district called Ghazipur in UP, there was no college there in that, okay. uh, that district. Mm -hmm. So from somewhere, my father appeared, <laughs> whom I had not known at all. And of course, I used to see him sometime. And he requested uh, my grandfather that I should be sent to him mm -hmm. to join the college in Muradabad. Okay. He used to be the CEO of the corporation in Muradabad. So I went there and uh, I did my intermediate from the government college Muradabad. Hmm. But there, uh, my stepmother had a niece. Okay. And uh, I fell in love with her. She was very beautiful. <laughs> right. Uh, and somehow, the, I mean, hmm. she also liked me. Well, sir, were you clear about your goal from the first day or you, you just got inspired by your maternal uncle and then you decided to go into civil service? I mean, the, I mean, that was really what my grandfather inspired me to. Okay, he, but your not grandfather this, not, inspired. But not the marriage at this young age. Okay. <laughs> that was totally unplanned. In fact, I mean, the whole family was opposed to it and uh, her family and my both. Because they said, what is this? This boy is just, he has just joined university. I have just finished my intermediate. Mm. And uh, while in intermediate, I just saw her and all this happened. And you got married. So Well, okay. I, I got married uh, after I had joined the university. But my family thought that uh, I would, I was lost. I, mean, mm. I won't be studying now. Mm. Right. Uh, but my wife was very strong and she said, I'll prove them wrong. <laughs> and uh, she even said, okay, if you give up your studies, then 
Are leave you. <laughs> so I did my okay, master's for three years. She said yes. she leave you yes. so if you don't study yeah. further. That's great. So for three years she really was my support. But in those years, like uh, nineteen, you're talking about nineteen fifties, right? So in those years, uh, women uh, were not that powerful or educated. But mashallah, as you're saying that your wife was so well aware and well learned that she forced you that no, you have to study. You have to. She emphasized. Not only importance. that, I mean, she got married to me. Yeah. <laughs> <Everything> that. <laughs> I mean, uh, you see, she also had a. Very unusual uh, life. Her father was a Pakhtun. Okay. He was from Dera Ismail Khan. Mm -hmm. And he had married in Muradabad uh, because uh, he used to come to Aligarh for his studies. Later on, he went to London and did his PhD and all that. So he saw. My mother's, uh, uh, my my wife's mother, and he fell in love with her, so he married her, <laughs> and she, as you know, in those days, although she was married and she went away to Dera Ismail Khan, mm -hmm. but for delivery of children, they would always come back to their maternal home. Okay. Yeah. So, when she came to deliver a third baby, which was my wife. She already had two daughters, mm -hmm. so my stepmother persuaded her that uh, you should. She was she had no children at that time. The children she had. So that's how she was adopted by okay. my stepmother. But uh, as soon as she had a child, uh, of course she was busy with the. Newly born child, mm. and her mother then adopted Hello. my would be <laughs> wife. <laughs> right. So, so, I mean, I'm telling you why I came to Pakistan because I had no plans to come to Pakistan. Mm -hmm. I mean, my my grandfather also was offered uh, because he knew all these people, the Muslim leaders, uh, uh, at that, that at, because he had retired in 1948, and they asked him to come as. Mm. Chairman of the Federal Public Service Commission, mm. uh, but he said, "No, I'm not going to leave my native place." So that so, was the love for the nation. Yes, that so I mean his homeland. Mm. So I was also not, I mean, never thinking of going to Pakistan. And anyway, anybody who used to come, they used to go to Karachi. I mean, most of the. Uh, so where were you originally? In which, hmm? in which country were you originally? Like you came back to Pakistan, as you were saying, right? No, I didn't come. I didn't come back to Pakistan. I came to Pakistan for the first time for from the first there. Time. From where? From that's what I'm saying. From, from which? From where? Point? UP and India. Where from are UP they? and India. Okay, okay. Sorry, I'm sorry. Right. This oh, yeah, I was in UP India. and India. Yeah. Of course, right. I was born there. Madhabad. So, when I had finished my master's, uh, by then I had also a daughter. Mm. So that was an added responsibility. So then I persuaded my wife that let's go to Pakistan because here the family has abandoned me. Mm. And I think we might have better chances of survival there. Mm. So, her father was at that time in uh, uh, Peshawar. She was practicing in the high court. He had done his uh, bar at law and doctorate from London. So we came to Peshawar. That's how this was in April 1953. Right. That's when I come, came to Pakistan. Okay. And obviously the English uh, subject was quite uh, sought after in his colleges. Mm. So I immediately got a job as lecturer. Okay, in Jahanzeb College, Swat. Okay. So that's where I started my career mm. as a lecturer in Jahanzeb. Right. But obviously that suited me also because that gave me all the time to prepare mm. 
for the competitive examination of the Central Superior Services Examination in Pakistan. And that's what I did in two years in 1955 when I got into the Premier Service, which used to be known as the CSP, the Civil Service. Okay. Uh, it's became, a dream for many youngsters. He became Deputy Commissioner yeah, and the last post was services. Commissioner Karachi and all that. Yeah, mashallah. So sir, how do you define success or what do you see? Like, well, Isha, I thought I had succeeded, you know, because I had succeeded. I, I, I got a very loving wife and uh, I got whatever I wanted to do, do in education. Okay. And I also got into the civil service. So achieving your goals was success for you? Achieving your time? At that time. At that time. But then you know, as they say that they are strange as the ways and the snares of fortune. Uh, as a CSP officer, we were trained for two years. One year in Pakistan. And one year we used to be sent to Oxford and Cambridge to do a postgraduate course in public administration. Okay. So I was sent to Cambridge. And on return then we used to be posted to our respective provinces, West Pakistan, East Pakistan. Mm -hmm. <coughs> when we came back um, after our usual courses, and we thought that we'll get a post into West Pakistan. Mr. Solvardi mm -hmm. was the Prime Minister at that time. Okay. And his party had won mm -hmm. elections in East Pakistan. Right. So the Chief Minister of East Pakistan, his Chief Minister, he wrote to him that he wanted all the East Pakistanis to be posted to East Pakistan. And on that, Mr. Swarthi wrote that all West Pakistanis should be posted to East Pakistan mm -hmm. and all East Pakistanis to West Pakistan. You know, these were the vision of the founding fathers of Pakistan because they wanted really integration. They integration. didn't want separation. So that the people living in East Pakistan can understand West Pakistanis yes, yes. and West ones can understand East, right? So there, my first posting as an assistant commissioner was in a place called Brahman Baria, mm -hmm. which was in Kumila district. And there, uh, in 1959, uh, USA had supported government of Pakistan to establish two academies for rural development. Mm -hmm. One was at Kumila and one was in Peshawar. Okay. And my subdivision was in Kumila. So one day when I was doing my court as a magistrate, you know, uh, I was told that there are five uh, gentlemen who have come to see you. Okay. And they had sent their names also, they were all PhDs. So I was quite intrigued. I said, all right, let me finish my case and I'll meet them. And they told me that uh, they are the, in the faculty of the Pakistan Academy for Rural Development at Kumila. Mm. And their director has said that, well, you may be PhDs, but you know nothing about the field, mm. field situation. So you better go and shadow this assistant commissioner for 15 days to see what he does. Mm. Just watch. Just to get a good so, understanding mm. about it. So then I was a bit intrigued. I said, and who is your director? Mm. And I was told that the director is one Mr. Dr. Nistra, whose whose uh, career was that he got into the ICS, Indian Civil Service, which used to be a world competitive examination. Mm -hmm. And after in the 10th year of his service, he resigned from the service and uh, he was in search of doing things which he wanted to do. So when I met him, I asked him, sir, why did you do that? I mean, look at us. Mm -hmm. We have <laughs> 
strived so and you have yeah. got into the service, service and all and that. You were and you got it. into it, you resigned it. Really? And he said, look, I mean, he was, uh, ICS officers also used to be, when they were posted to India, they were posted to the provinces. Hmm. So he was posted to your province, Bengal. Bengal, West Bengal. And, as you know, in the 40s, famine happened in Bengal. Mm. And a lot of people died and all that. And he was, I think, assistant commissioner in uh, Natrakuna. Mm. And he said that, uh, although the British were very good in law and order, in keeping Pax Britannica, in doing mega, major, mega projects like railways and Indus, Mm. water system and all that. But for the poor there was nothing. And he got so disheartened that he said he resigned. Mm. But he said like foolishly, I thought that I have to experience poverty to be able to do something for the poor. Mm. Right. And uh, he went back to his original uh, place of birth which was Agra in UP. Mm. And uh, Aligarh, in which the locks were very famous of Aligarh. He started as an apprentice of a locksmith okay. for two years. And then said that I realized I became a very good locksmith. Mm. I could make good locks, but I was doing nothing for the poor. Mm. And then he left it and came. Uh, Lama Mishraki had you know, the Khaksar movement, he joined that movement. Mm. Mm. But there also he was disillusioned. Then he came to Jawan Millia in Delhi, where Zakir Hussain, who later on became the president of India, was a rector. And finally he came back. Pakistan had been created by then. And he came back to Kobila, okay. where they offered him, as Bernard Shaw has said, that if you can't do anything, teach. So he became principal of the Victoria College in Kumila. Okay. And there, one of his batchmates, Mr. Asfar, he was Chief Secretary of East Pakistan at that time, mm. when this academy was created. So, Akhtar Hamid Khan told me, he called him, he said, hey, what are you doing, Kumila, come here, mm. I want to meet you. I said that, after you are a fool, but a good fool. <laughs> now, right. You want to do something for the poor, what? here is this academy created for that, yeah. for poverty reduction. Okay. Why don't you become director? You will have all the resources mm. and you will really be do, able to. Yeah. Now you have seen for 20 years, mm. you have been running from pillar to post and you have not been able to do anything. Mm. So this was the background of this man. Who, the, who sent these people and I I have not met him but you know in those days uh, East Pakistan I mean the only means of transport for uh, us was a bicycle mm -hmm. or we will go on foot mm -hmm. or if there was uh, some place which was near river or something then we'll go by boat mm -hmm. And there was a, I don't know if you remember that, there used to be a green arrow which used to railway from Chittagong to Dhaka and Dhaka to Chittagong. Okay. So whenever I had to go to some place which was on the railway station, then I would take go by train. Or else you would take huh. cycle. So bicycle. one day I had gone to a place called Akara mm -hmm. and when I was returning, for Brahman Bariya, which is about half an hour away from my train. I saw somebody sitting in a compartment, a very impressive, but also dressed in Khadar. Mm. So when I entered, I greeted him. Mm. And uh, he said, uh, who are you? So I was the assistant commissioner. So I said very proudly, I am the assistant commissioner of Brahman Bariya. <laughs> And he said, oh, so you are Shweb Sultan's son. Okay. I was shocked that how does he know yeah. who I am? 
So he said, no, I have sent my faculty members mm. and for 14 days they shadowed you and then you were put under a microscope and you came out with flying colors. Okay. So that was my first meeting mm. with the man who completely changed, changed my right. thinking okay. and what I should be doing. It took me some time because I saw how he did for the poor in uh, that area. In, in fact, the program was adopted for the whole of East Pakistan mm. and uh, West Pakistan never took any advantage of that. Mm. But it took me time, of course. I had, he used to call himself a Buddhist Muslim. And uh, he said, look, I mean, I'm so attached to my family, otherwise I would have really become uh, Buddha's disciple. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, uh, I mean, in about five years' time, I was posted back to West Pakistan. Mm -hmm. He didn't want me to come back. He said, well, you are running away. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I also love my family as you do. Mm -hmm. And they are not prepared to stay home. <laughs> yeah. He's, they used to say, as somebody said, is jal me, jab jal me, bagal me, paske. <laughs> so, it took me time, but when I was Commissioner Karachi in 1971, mm. and uh, the government decided it's a very powerful post, and especially the politicians, because the new government had come in. Mm. Uh, Mr. Bhutto's cousin was the governor there. So they decided to abolish the post of commissioner. And uh, I said, well, this is your prerogative. Mm -hmm. But uh, Mr. Mantaj Bhutto said, okay, but we will not let you go from here. Okay. <laughs> I said, this is what was my first posting yeah. to sin. <laughs> and if you really want to help me, then I'd like to go. Pakistan Academy for Rural Development Peshawar. Okay. Because of this trouble there with Bangladesh coming into existence, mm. army people had by force brought Akhtar Amit Khan to West Pakistan. Mm. Although he said, I told me nobody is going to say anything to me, but anyway. And I thought this was a good chance really to put his ideas into action mm. under his tutelage. Mm. So, from 1972, then I said goodbye to the civil service mm. and started doing rural development. So, how does it feel like owning somebody's dream, owning somebody's vision and mission and carrying it on? Well, I had achieved everything in that dream. I mean, mm -hmm. I must say that those 25 years in government, mm -hmm. I learned a lot and I don't think that I would probably have been able to mm. do what I was able to do. Right. From so you achieved to, what all you dreamt of and yes. then you discovered In the, the civil service, of service I mean, I had, I mean, I had seen the status, I had seen Fame, uh, all the respect and everything that right. uh, that had inspired me watching uh, uh, my grandfather because my grandfather also one of the things which leads to, uh, in fact, uh, basically, struck me most was that every winter for four months mm. he used to be touring the district living under canvas from village to village meeting people mm. hearing their problems and complaints solving them on the spot mm. so that part of it also was something which attracted me very much mm. but uh, obviously i mean uh, the main thing which I learned from Akhtar Amit Khan was that uh, after all, where is poverty? Poverty is at the household level. Now, none of the programs of government aim the household. Mm. They are, although they are macro and even the micro go right up to maybe village, not beyond that. Mm. But he said that, look, these two pillars of the state, the administrative pillar from the president right down to Patwari, mm. or the political pillar, 
from National Assembly right down to Union Council or Imran Khan is now bringing in village council. But none of them have the capacity to reach each and every household. Right. So you need a third pillar and he used to call it the socio-economic pillar. Okay. Because you know, he would say that look, Lincoln's definition of democracy, hmm. it says of the people, by the people, for the people. Hmm. So he said, by the people are the elected, hmm. the national, the, the political pillar. The political pillar. For the people is the administrative pillar. Right. Where is all the people? Unless and until you involve each and every right. household in their planning and developing themselves, mm. how are you going to really eradicate poverty? Right. So that was the mission mm. which he gave and taught okay. me. And by remaining in government, I tried to do it in the academy for mm. five years. I was there, well, actually for three years. But then uh, I was doing that in Pakhtun area mm. and the government of the day, which was again Mr. Bhutto's government, and he should have understood it better. They said okay, he's uh, basically subversive government. Mm. He's organizing the Pakhtuns so that they can rise against the government. And one day I was uh, posted out as OST. Officer on a special duty means that you have no duty. <laughs> Akhtar Amit Khan had come back from, he had gone to Michigan State mm -hmm. University as a visiting professor, but when he saw this, what I was doing, he came back and advised me how to implement this program okay. for three years. So, under and his guidance, you learned yes, exactly became, how to... I mean, it became uh, internationally famous. In fact, mm. uh, the USAID's ideologue at that time, mm. uh, when he came and visited, he said, how do we persuade presidents and mm. prime ministers to make this program, which was called Z, as the centerpiece for poverty reduction. Mm. So, that was when they had... Made me OSD after the meet Khan went away and discussed back to Michigan. I decided it's time now to leave the civil service. Okay. But I could not do this work. Mm -hmm. Like him, I mean, he said, hey, you should experience poverty. I thought that no, I should better leave this service and find something which gives meaning to your life. Uh -huh. And uh, unfortunately, because this Yudauze had become so famous that. I was offered a consultancy by UN Center for Regional Development in mm. Japan, mm. asking me to come and write uh, my experiences of Daozi, because they said that it would be very interesting. Mm. So I went there while I was writing that, and I finished that book. And by the way, that book was published in India by Vikas. Mm. So I was. Uh, I was, uh, was, I think I, it was UNICEF, yes. UNICEF came to me that we want a, we are starting a program in Sri Lanka mm. for poverty reduction. Mm. Why don't you? So just one question is coming to my mind. Like I have also read about, uh, like in a book, Genocide, if you have read it, uh, they, some people or there is a perspective that they don't believe in that we can ever reduce poverty. You can only eliminate poverty by killing people, by genocide. So, uh, what is your viewpoint about it? Because they no, say no, that no. it's impossible to reduce the no, poverty. It's no, no, just, it is not impossible. No how, how have these countries, you know what Akhtar Amit Khan was telling me? Mm. You know, he was, I mean, I still remember his conversation once when I, when I was a state commissioner. Uh, and he saw what I was trying to do. He said, what are you trying to do? You cannot be a reformer, only profits are reformers. And don't try to invent. Inventions are very rare. 
And of course, revolutionary, you can't be, I mean, like the genocide that you're talking mm. about. You have joined the civil service. Mm. So. so I said, then what should I do? He said, look what I'm doing. And I was shocked, you know, when he said, what are you doing, sir? He said, I'm a copycat. I have seen what happened in Europe, what happened in Japan, what happened in Taiwan, what happened in those countries which were poorer or not poor today. Mm. And he used to specifically quote a German called Reifeisen, who in 1849, he was the mayor of a, a small principality, mm. but he would collect all the poor peasants and assetless and tell them that, look, you are being crushed by three giants. And in 1849, who were the three giants in Germany? The landlord, the money lender and the shopkeeper. Mm. Do you see those giants here also? Mm. And he said that you cannot do, individually you will never be able to overcome these handicaps. Mm. So he enunciated three principles of poverty reduction. The poor have to agree to organize. If they don't organize, they will never be able to get out of poverty. Mm. Secondly, he said the poor must believe that they have the potential to get out of poverty. Right. And it's all a question of how that potential can be unleashed. And it is only they who can Do it. identify, mm -hmm. who can identify what the obstacles are. True. For obstacles they need help. And that is where the role of any organization, anybody who wants to help comes. That how do you really help them to overcome those obstacles? But along with that, he also told them, uh, my father said that, look, capital is power. Mm -hmm. The world, basically, if you say that God governs the world, you know that the best complete book that's there in the world, it has only one word in it. The heading is who governs the world. Mm -hmm. And there is one word, money. Money. And that's yeah, supposed that's to be a complete book. Mm -hmm. So that's what our officer was saying. That if you really want to attract money, then you have to generate your own capital through savings. So the lesson was, you must save. Okay. And thirdly, he said, okay, yes, I mean, you need a catalyst, and uh, whoever catalyst you need, his job would be really to help you do that. Okay. So basically... So, you know, these principles have already been, and Akhtar Khan used to say that these principles are as precise as the law of gravity. Mm. Okay. Of course, if you go against them, that you won't be able to reduce poverty mm. or eliminate poverty. Right. But uh, saying that uh, you should have genocide too. Mm. <laughs> That's one extreme. Poverty, <laughs> that's absurd. Uh, that's one because this takes a lot of effort. Like, you know, you have to development the rural development programs that you're running, mashallah. It's uh, difficult to bring change in the people to but make them so, understand, you know, especially the, people, the poor people who are not who does not belong do not you know, belong from an educational I mean, background. The main it's, thing is uh, that as the Chinese say that the thousand job mile journey mm -hmm. starts with the first yeah, step. First step. In 1982, mm. when, uh, fortunately for me, while I was in the UN, I was offered a golden opportunity by Zionist Aga Khan that I should initiate his Aga Khan River Support Program in Gilgit, Pakistan and Chitral. Mm. And in my first meeting, I, I said, uh, Your Highness, 
Why have you selected me? I'm not a smiley. <laughs> so he said, but this program is not for a smileys. In that area, there are only 30% of smileys. Mm. 70% are non smileys. Mm. But it is such a sensitive area. Because on one side is China, then there is uh, India, then there is Afghanistan. And in those days, Russia also used to be there. Mm. So unless and until each and every household is helped, islands of power, islands of prosperity will not survive. Okay. So you know, that gave me an opportunity, but I started with one village, Japuka, I still remember, mm -hmm. in uh, 12th December 1982. And you know, 12 years while I worked there, and fortunately for me, the Akhan Foundation Geneva was able to persuade World Bank to evaluate the program. Okay. The first evaluation when they came after five years, they said that the first five years of AKRSP mm -hmm. are the missed five years of all World Bank supported rural development programs. Because the bank went with the blueprint. <laughs> but here, there is a process approach. They are asking people what you can do, why you are not able to do, and then helping them to do that. Was it beneficial yes. for them? And uh, you know, AGRSP had only two objectives. One was that in 10 years, the income of the people should be doubled. Mm. Or in the process, if we can develop a replicable model for other areas, regions. Mm. So, after 10 years when the bank came for the second evaluation, they said that in real terms, the income of the million people of Gilgit Baltistan has doubled. Now, that of course became the tested and tried way, mm. Marshall. Then I was invited by UN again, mm. why don't you take the lessons of AKRSP to South Asia? Mm. And would you believe that in South Asia, the only country which basically adopted this approach mm. in full way was India. In Andhra Pradesh, 11 million mm. women got organized. And then India launched another program called National Rural Livelihoods Mission, which is for the 700, uh, for 70 million households. Okay. Well, now Mr. Modi has come and is <laughs> messing it up all. Right. Otherwise, if you go to Andhra, it is a different uh, district or uh, state altogether. So, that is... That was your efforts, mashallah. So, Sir Shweb, uh, listening and con having this conversation with you, what I uh, understood and what I am taking away from this conversation is that success is to find your purpose of life, find who you are. And as you did, mashallah, you joined civil services and then you realized that you would like to contribute to the society by helping the poor to come out of poverty. So uh, that's what I learned from this whole conversation. The main thing is, Asha, that I was lucky because I was able to find someone who showed me the way. You found a mentor. Hmm. who True. told me, who showed me the way Surely. that look what you are doing it has already been done in the world. Hmm. Look at Pakistan, what is the problem in Pakistan? Hmm. They all the time they want to <laughs> start something new. Hmm. I mean, you have seen. Hmm. What does it, I mean for example, look at what is happening now. There is no dearth of resources. Mm. But instead of giving people 2,000 rupees every month and 24,000 rupees in a year, mm. you could sit down with them. Teach them how to them. unleash their potential. I mean, mm. I mean you will be surprised that uh, and you should go and see that area in Sindh, where we are now working with almost uh, 
20 lakh women, 2 million women mm. households. Poorest of the poor. Mm. And they have come out. And then when, when I asked the cook what you can do, why you are not able to do it, mm. and they said, well, we have no money. Mm. And how much money did they ask initially? No more than less than 20,000. Mm. So, and, and now with that 20,000, and I, I created what I called a community investment fund, okay. which is a revolving fund. That, mm. All right, I'll give you 20,000, and you are saying that you will be able to earn that much. Mm. Then, don't spend it, revolve it. Okay. And with the result that this revolving has meant that they have created in three, four years assets worth 100,000 and more. Okay. And now, you know, with this, I hope that this program is launched, Kamiya Pakistan, okay. where the Mr. Shaukat Tareem is offering 500,000 rupees interest free. Mm -hmm. okay. These women are now capable of using that money. Right. So don't give them fish, teach them how to fish. Right. That's well, that's a very simple. <laughs> That doesn't really tell people <laughs> what it is. It misleads them. Okay. No. It is, I mean, you can say it is basically, I mean, if you're talking of poverty, I've told you that mm. what are the ingredients. Mm. Organized. Is, you can say that this is teaching fish, mm. that you should get organized and you should really? find a leader amongst you and you should start saving. You and you should unleash, identify what potential you have. Mm. If it is teaching fish, all right. But, but you know, this has to be explained. This, has to, this is a framework, a, a framework to come out of poverty, right? Which no, is these are, as I, as I said, these are the tested and tried principles, principles. of okay. subsist, subsistence development. Mm. So, subsistence development, you have to apply these principles. Mm. Right. So, first you have to, because you know, every thing that you do, the backing should be, as Afad Amit Khan used to say, a principle as precise as the law of gravity. Mm. Because if you're not doing that, then you're going astray. You're going astray. And that's what is happening all the time. Mm. Exactly. People don't adopt those principles. Mm. They want to deviate. They, they want they to bring their follow own. Follow the myths. Yes, they think that they are very clever and they can mm. bring this and bring that. But it doesn't work. It doesn't work. True, true. Uh, can we apply this these principles on individual level? Like you're doing it as an organization, as a, a community of developed the rural programs. So can we, like um, a student, an individual, a, a citizen, how can he contribute into this program or how can he apply it? It all depends what he's doing, okay. what he wants to do. Okay. Yeah. So it is applicable, it is a principle which is applicable on individual level as well as on big levels. No, no this, is, this is a principle which really applies at every level. Yeah, at every level. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much, Sir Shiv. Any message which you would like to give to our audience, to your viewers? Over what to what you. lesson you want me to give? No, whatever. Any message. Uh, with, uh, the only lesson which I have drawn from my experience mm. that if you are committed and if you believe in something uh, and you have the the right principles to implement it, and you will always succeed. But if you deviate, then of course. Mm -hmm. But the main thing is that one should know what one is capable of doing. And we that is the most important thing. Because something which you can do, I mean like, uh, what Dr. Amit Khan's advice was that build your own island. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about what is happening around you. If you have no control on those things, then what's the point? Mm -hmm. But if in that situation you can do something, 
can concentrate on that. True. Okay, so how, like, um, on your journey, you must have met with failures and with times when you felt demotivated. How did you overcome those times? Now, for example, failure in this is that if, uh, I mean, this all depends on the willingness of the community. Hmm. If the community is not willing, if they say, no, we can't get organized. Hmm. I mean, for example, the first time I met uh, uh, Jaheed Be Nazir when he was Prime Minister this time, and I mentioned this to her, and she said, well, uh, it's a revolutionary program, a revolutionary approach, mm -hmm. uh, but it will be very difficult to implement. Yes, indeed. In, in sin, uh, people just are fighting all the time. There are tribes, there are this, that, and the other. But it's all a question of them putting across a message to the people. Yeah. And then their willingness to come out of it and to follow those principles. I mean, look at Sen. I mean, who, had, who had thought that 20 million people, uh, 20 uh, lakh, 2 million women, mm -hmm. who were the poorest of the poor, would be would, 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 would willing to do all this. Mm -hmm. But they are. But they are. Right. Thank you so much, Sir Shahid Sultan Khan. It was amazing talking with you and learning so much about your life, about what you think about success and those principles taught by Akhtar Ramid Khan. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, listeners, and signing off for today. I love this. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>